Hey, welcome to the channel. So today I wanted to try something a little bit different than I normally do on this channel. I know that I'm uh, normally doing game related stuff, but um, lately I just haven't had a whole lot of games that uh, are really catched my attention. I'm kind of waiting for a few updates on some, but anyway, I thought I'd try something a little different for this video. This is, um, I have a, a love of sci-fi books and, and uh, universes especially, ones that have like expanded universes. I think everybody does as the new MCU movies show. So um, I wanted to do a timeline for Larry Niven's known space universe. Now the first book that I would suggest reading in this universe is actually one of the later ones chronologically. Um, so I will get to it, but it'll probably be uh, closer to the end. I want to do this chronologically um, and focus mostly at this video on Earth and its, uh, its story. Because there's a whole lot of history in known space and I can't really go over all of it in one. So um, let's begin. Oh, and as a side note, um, I, I'd want this to be fun not only for people that are already familiar with the universe, I want this to be fun for, you know, everybody that gets into it. So, like, hopefully I'll be drawing a few new people to uh, Larry Niven's work. Alright, so let's start in the beginning with the Thrintern, about three billion years ago. So not much is known about the Thrintern, uh, both by humans and in lore, you know, as book readers. Uh, most of the info in the universe comes from... Um, discoveries of their slaver lock boxes. These are both uh, indestructible and impervious to time. They are also used as emergency protection as the slaver stasis fields, leading to the events of the book The World of Patavs, which is the only book we really have about the slavers, and it's um, most of it's set in, in current times. But um, it's about a living Thrint who is. Uh, he gets uh, saved by his slaver stasis field and is released during the early space age of humanity. The Thrintern are telepathic and they can control other sentient creatures. Um, their form of telepathy, however, seems to be a little more like brainwashing than direct control because it's said that they can rule over entire planets, um, entire species basically, but their control's not total. Um, so it reminds me more of uh, fascist propaganda. They're kind of like the, the original space Nazis, you know? I don't think you can get uh, more OG than three billion years ago. <laughs> Despite uh, ruling for around a billion years, from about three billion to about two billion years ago, and spreading across most of the Milky Way, um, they were eventually defeated by one of their own slave races. The I believe this is pronounced Tenuktapun. <laughs> um, during the Thrintern expansion across the galaxy, they would seed planets with a special yeast that was designed to both be edible to them and it would uh, terraform the planet to their liking. One of the last food worlds they created before they uh, they died was Earth. So they never got to harvest anything from Earth, but they did seed it with their yeast. Um, this left the life on Earth to evolve naturally for almost two billion years before the Pack Protectors showed up. Pack Protectors are fiercely intelligent, but instinct-driven warriors. They only have one goal, protect their lineage. You see, the Pack Protector has three stages of life. Stage one is childhood, where they're both sexually immature and mentally immature. At stage two, they are a breeder. They are sexually mature, but still mentally immature. And the third and final stage is protector, where they are sterile sexually, but finally they are mentally mature. When a breeder reaches a certain age, they will begin to crave a specific root, the root of the tree of life. When they eat this root, the virus in the root changes the DNA of the breeder and they become a protector physically different, stronger, smarter, more durable. Once the change occurs, the Protector's only goal in life is to ensure the survival of its family. But as all intelligent creatures know, resources are not infinite, so wars between families are common, and the Pack homeworld is a very dangerous place. One family decided that the safest course of action was immigration, so around two and a half million years ago, they set out looking for a new home. They found Earth. But it turned out the soil of the earth was not right for the virus that lived in the Tree of Life root. So there was no way to make new protectors, and eventually all the old ones died. This left the breeders to keep breeding without oversight. All the hominids on earth are their descendants, including humans. 
The early space age of humanity went uh, somewhat predictably, with humanity expanding out slowly to the other planets and the asteroid belts. This is until the Bussard Ramjet was invented. Now, I'm not going to go too much into the technical details of the Bussard Ramjet because it's an actual theoretical device and I don't want to embarrass myself by uh, getting everything wrong. But um, this propulsion can go uh, get you very close to the speed of light, but it has a very slow acceleration, to get, so to get there would take a very long time. Uh, once humanity was armed with this Bussard Ramjet, they, were, they began to settle the stars. Obviously, Earth isn't 100% habitable. Humans can't live in volcanoes or in the ocean. Because of this, the early probes were not programmed to look for habitable planets, but rather habitable spots on those planets. This ended up placing some of the earliest colonies in very odd places. The first planet settled seems to be Wonderland, which makes sense as it's the closest to Earth. Uh, like most human colony worlds, its name is very descriptive of how it is. It's a nice, habitable planet, unlike uh, the next to be settled, Jinx. Jinx is the moon of a gas giant. It is not just tidally locked, meaning that one side faces the, the gas giant at all times, but it's actually being pulled into an egg shape by the gravity of the gas giant it's orbiting. This leaves only two bands around the equator that are habitable. The planet of Plateau, likewise, is only habitable on its high plateau, and Canyon is only habitable in a deep canyon, but all have colonies of humans living on these zones. And now it's time for the fluffy, cuddly space Klingons! Well, I guess Klingons. But, yeah, who wouldn't love the Kazenti? Nobody! That's why literally everyone has written a man Kazin Wars novel, or at least story to go with one. At the point that the humans and Kazinti first come in contact, the Kazinti have much better weaponry, tech, and are much more aggressive. There were considered to be four different man Kazin wars, but in my opinion it's more of uh, four waves of attacking in one long war. Humans defending had a range advantage for reinforcements, but otherwise only survived through ingenuity and creative thinking. Which is why Wonderland was lost to the Kazinti for a while, and why the war seemed to be lost until the Outsiders made contact with We Made It. Not much is known about the Outsiders. Their tech seems to be one of the most advanced and known space. They live in the vacuum of space on city-sized spaceships that travel around at relativistic speeds, but with almost instant acceleration and deceleration that should shred them and their spaceships to atoms. They don't seem to have any interest in violence, but are willing to make trades. When colonists from the planet of We Made It first contacted the Outsiders by chance, they instantly saw the possibilities and traded for a hyperdrive blueprint. A new kind of faster than light engine. This engine can make a ship travel at the rate of one light year every three days. Once We Made It brought one of their new spaceships to Earth and found out about the man Kazin Wars, they provided Earth with the blueprints and instantly turned the tide of the war. Okay, I couldn't think of how to do this section without any spoilers, so this is your spoiler warning. If you don't want any spoilers, you should probably end the video right here. Otherwise, let's keep going. The Ring World is by far the largest structure in the known space universe. It's a one million mile wide strip that circles its star at about the same orbit as the Earth, creating more land area than over three million Earths. It has a secondary ring inside the first that acts as the ring's day and night cycle, alternatively allowing light through and blocking it out for nighttime. By the time the puppeteers showed it to Louis Wu, it was almost a million years old already. Just like the Earth, it was originally meant to be a pack protector sanctuary away, away from the wars of the pack homeworld. But like the Earth, although for different reasons, it failed and was left without any pack protectors. Because of its massive size and lack of any predators, the breeders evolved to fill every ecological niche. TV missed a great opportunity with this in my opinion. They already make every alien humanoid, and on the ring world every creature is related to humans, so there's reason for it to be humanoid. From the grazing cow people, to the typical human hunters, to the humanoid carrion eaters. On the ring world, weird cat-human hybrids actually make sense. Alright, well if you're still here, thank you for that, and if you like this at all, uh, please like, comment, and subscribe, and if I get enough likes, maybe I'll make another. I know several more sci-fi universes, and I could also do a lot more here in uh, Larry Niven's known space universe, so let me know in the comments if either of those sound like something you would want to see. So thanks again, and take care.